All right, New York State SGEIS proposed new regulation says, I'm gonna read it. In most cases, an additional third cemented well casing is required around each well, we all speak English, to prevent the migration of gas. Let's speak English to, other, English to each other. When you hear somebody say to prevent, does that mean reduce the probability or does it mean make the probability go to zero? Prevent means go to zero. Is it possible? Can New York State have a regulation that will guarantee that in no circumstance in New York State will there ever be methane migration? That's stupid to write something like that. No scientist or engineer with a brain would accept that. Furthermore, it's deceptive. The implication here is that New York State for the first time is gonna require a third string of casing. Third string, you mean it's not just one continuous pipe? No. Let me show you what I mean, okay? Here's a casing diagram required at the time of application for permit to drill a well. You have to show your casing diagram. It's not to scale. Every one of these black lines is a casing. So at the top, okay, there's a surface casing called a conductor casing. Uh, it's typically 13, 14 inches in diameter. Only goes down 25, 50 feet. It forms a base for the blowout preventer. Then you have surface casing which in this case went down 1,094 feet, it's 9.6 inches in diameter. Then there was seven inch casing that went down 1,534 feet. And then there was production casing that went all the way down to 7,300 feet. How many layers of casing do you see there? Four. But New York State is saying they're now gonna require three, as if that's something new. This is an actual well endemic that failed with four layers of casing. New York State is trying to pull the wool over your eyes, DEC, by letting you think that because they're now going to require, quote, an extra level of casing to prevent migration, that is really misinformation and it's disingenuous. It implies that it's something new and it's not. I will bet my reputation that the vast majority of gas and oil wells drilled in New York in the last 10 years have at least four levels of casing already. Both of these wells failed. Both wells have four layers of casing. An extra layer of casing does not guarantee that it won't fail. It doesn't matter how many layers of steel you have, it only matters the outside layer of cement. And guess what? It doesn't matter how many layers of steel you have, you're always going to have an outside layer of cement. Obvious? If that outside layer fails, the wall fails. In fact, I argue, and I argued this to DEC in my comments to their SGEIS, the more layers of casing and the more levels of cement you have, the higher the probability of failure that somebody will go wrong. We'll see. So, the truth is that fluid migration from faulty wells is a well-known chronic problem. It has always happened, it will always happen because it's just too complex a process to make guaranteed that it will be, that cement will always prevent, any number of layers of cement or casing will prevent, make zero probability. To prevent is to make zero probability failure of a well. Impossible. And we know the expected rate of occurrence. One out of every 20 wells will fail initially. Maybe not in this county, but if you take all the counties in Pennsylvania right now and you count up the number of wells that have been drilled in the Marcellus and you count the number of failures, it's about 5% so far, but those wells are all young. No Marcellus well in Pennsylvania, there's one Marcellus well in Pennsylvania that's seven years old. The vast majority are, are fewer than three years old. Say again? No, we're only up to 4,500, 4,600 Marcellus wells in Pennsylvania so far. So, so what? I asked the same question again, who cares that wells fail? Well, as I showed you, you are getting methane. Hold on. The methane is either coming up through the underground source of drinking water, which means it can now get into an underground source of drinking water. And it's not just methane. It's whatever else is down there, gas or liquid. And it also comes to the surface in the form of bubbling in cellars and streams and forest floors, which means you're now exhausting methane into the atmosphere. And methane, as we're going to learn maybe sometime tonight, is a very, very potent greenhouse gas. Really bad. You have a question? Yeah. Um, it seems to me that you said the first year the production goes way down. Yes. So most wells that fail after 20 or 30 years, is there still methane in there that's come out? 
That's an excellent question, and the reason why I can't answer it with respect to shale gas wells is we don't have a 20-year-old shale gas well. The oldest shale gas wells using this technology are nine years old. We don't know yet. Excellent question. Uh, well, companies at this point are willing to make interpolations. They can say, on an average, the 13,500 shale gas wells in Barnett, on average, I have that data here. Uh, let me show you the data later. I can show you data from, Mar from the Barnett um, of the distribution of productivity of wells. But what I can't show you is how that distribution is changing over time because we only have seven or eight years of data. We don't know what a shale gas well will be doing in 20 years. Okay, so the, the, the so what is there's health impact. You're either going to be contaminating private drinking water wells or you're going to be exhausting methane and other hydrocarbons into the atmosphere. That's what's bad about loss of wellbore integrity. How are we doing on time? Good. Let's go to this one. Okay, next one. The use of multi-well pads and cluster drilling reduce surface impacts. I'm sure my colleague Don Siegel said, boy, because we have multi-wells on a pad, uh, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot less impact on the surface. Compared to what? Right now we have no impact on the surface. Okay, and he wants you to believe, and the industry wants you to believe that, well, you know, what we could do is drill one vertical well every 40 acres, and that would be really bad. Would they do that? No, that's absurd. They would never do that for reasons I already told you. It's geologically nonsense, economically stupid to drill one well on a pad every 40 acres. So it's a false comparison. He wants you to compare the mental image of one well every 40 acres with 16 wells on a pad and then another pad a kilometer away. That's a false comparison. You're supposed to be comparing 16 wells on a pad and another pad a kilometer away in each direction with what we have now, which is nothing. nothing. Now, which has the larger surface impact? Nothing or what I'm about to show you? <laughs> It's a logical non it's logical nonsense. All right, I showed you this. Let me show you some real photographs. At one time in mid 2010, this was the largest hydraulic fracturing pad in a shale formation anywhere in the world, northeastern British Columbia, where many of the companies operating in Pennsylvania are experimenting with their technology. Because in northeastern British Columbia, they can get away with murder because there aren't too many people around. And they have a regulatory environment that's very permissive. So this is not a three-acre pad with a single well in the middle of it. This is a 16-well pad. I hope you can see some of the technology and the pumps, the scale. This is a large industrial complex. It takes years to do this. Not days, not weeks. It's not here today. You know, we'll come in, Joel, well in your backyard. We'll be gone in a few months. No. This is a, a map of that region. That pad I just showed you is this one. Notice the pattern, just like in the Barnett Shale, the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Uh, eight, 10 wells going in one direction and eight or 10 wells going in the other direction. That's the objective. That's how you get a lot of gas out of a shale formation. Here's an image of the current largest shale gas pad in the world. Again, northeastern British Columbia. This is not three acres. This is about two kilometers. Okay. Um, freshwater pond, because they needed 417 million gallons of water to do all the fracking. Okay. Waste pond, uh, 78,000 tons of sand brought in by truck, 8 million gallons of fracking chemicals, 500 separate frack jobs, two mile long laterals, and 40,000 horsepower pumps to do the frack job. How would you like to live downwind and down ear and down dust of that for about a year and a half? That's what's coming to town, folks. Uh, is this a cumulative over the course of the 20-year lifespan or just for one year? No, this is what was necessary to drill and frack 16 wells at that pad. All that happened over a period of about a year. That's what the industry wants to do, because that's the most economical thing to do for them. 
But that picture itself doesn't explain everything because it appears that, okay, so they're two mile long laterals. They come out to about here, eight of them going in this direction, eight of them going in this direction. Uh, Professor Graffier, shouldn't there be another pad just like that right here? And another pad like that right here? And another pad like that here and here? Yeah. They just uh, gotten, haven't gotten around to do it there yet. So I'll show you where they are doing it. Um, when a company, an operator, goes to DEC, DEC, and says, we want a permit to drill, they have to show a map of what they call the drilling unit. The drilling unit is something that is agreed upon uh, by three parties. One is DEC, has to agree that the company that seeks the permit to develop wells in that area has dotted their I's and crossed their T's and done everything that regulations require. The company has to get the agreement of all of the landowners. No, compulsory integration says that if six, as long as land controlled by 60%, as long as 60% of the land is controlled by landowners who say yes, the other landowners can't say no. That's compulsory integration in New York State. They don't have it in Pennsylvania. They don't have it in Texas. We're advanced civilization here. But you'll notice something. This spacing unit is rectangular. And in this case, they wanted to drill 10 wells, five in this direction, five in this direction. Why is it rectangular? Yeah, because they want to have a mile and a half long lateral here or a mile long lateral and a mile, okay, so it's going to be a rectangle. Why is it oriented in this north, northwest, south, southeast? Because that's where the most fractures will be intersected. That's a geological thing. So what you see in this application, in this map, is the combination of geology and landowners. That's what I mean down here. Geology and leasing control the ability of a company to do what it wants to do. Hold on to that one second, because I want to show one more slide here now. So let's see how this translates. Let's imagine at some point in the future, shale gas development comes to Enfield. Here we are. Okay. So this is to scale. And imagine that one company, without any competition, got 60% of the land controlled by willing landowners in this entire region of this map. It's a hypothetical. It's not likely to happen. But you did see that it has happened in some places. What would it look like? Those are rectangles that are two miles long, half mile wide. And those would be 10 well units. You'll notice that the, each one of these red squares is a pad roughly in the center of the spacing unit. And the distance between pads is not two miles. It depends upon the arrangement. It could be very close. It could be a half a mile. So when Professor Siegel stands here and says, oh, no, there's not very much surface impact. Well, surface impact to me would be I got 10 wells here, and I move a half a mile away, and there's 10 more wells. And what's the remnant surface impact? Excuse me? Uh, 10 acres. That's not the scale. That's not 10 acres. But it, just in case you're thinking I'm blowing smoke here, that I'm, I'm being alarmist, Professor Siegel says I'm alarmist. I only tell you what the industry tells me to tell you. All the data I've shown you is from the industry or from the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental, Environmental Preservation. I haven't given you any information or data that is not publicly available to anybody who wants to go look for it. My job is to interpret it for you. You can accept my interpretation or not. But let me show you what Shell has planned for our neighbors in Tioga County, Pennsylvania. This is a map of Tioga County, Pennsylvania. Notice the Shell symbol? This is Shell's map. Not mine. It's not my imagination. This is Shell's map. This is a map they gave to the EPA at a meeting in Washington, D.C. last April where I was in attendance. And see all these little rectangular things here? What are those? Spacing units. And what are the black dots? Pads. OK, that's the plan. There will be something like 2,000 wells drilled by Shell alone on those pads in Tioga County. 
Where are the towns? Uh, let's see, these are townships. Each one of these yellow things is a township in Pennsylvania. So I don't know, I don't think the towns are shown here. You can, you know, well, you can Google Earth and overlay it if you want. Um, but I'll come back, there were two questions here, but I wanna make sure that you understand what surface impact actually looks like on a multi well pad. So industry is usually gonna show you the picture of one well. You're gonna see a little Christmas tree and a little tank, and they're gonna say, this is what's left when we're done. And that is extremely deceptive. Misinformation, disingenuous. Here's somebody's private home. Here's somebody's private home. Here is a nine, nine well pad. Uh, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in and show you what this looks like. This stuff is here forever. As long as those wells are in production, everything you see here is there. Okay, they happen to build a very large pond here for waste disposal. That's a frack waste disposal pond. You want your kids playing in the backyard here? Okay, that's surface impact. Don, where are you? Okay. Uh, I'll zoom in again. This is, uh, this is another nine well pad. Here's the kind of excavation that goes on. I'm gonna zoom in and show you what's remnant here. That's what you need to support a nine well pad. Okay, separators, dehumidifiers. Oh, solar panels, green. Condensate tanks. Not those little thousand gallon plastic ones, are they? Okay, so that's your footprint forever in your backyard. I love this one. <laughs> uh, as you well know, there are not only wells and pads, but there have to be gathering pipelines to connect all the wells to compressor stations and processing stations and dehumidifiers. Uh, this is the excavation for the largest compressor station east of the Mississippi. It's going to have 14 compressors, 50,000 horsepower. That'll give you the idea of the amount of excavation that's going to have to go on to support that compressor station. And there won't be just one of them. Excuse me? Yes. So there were some questions here that I want to get to. Somebody had their hands up. Yes. Absolutely. It's required. As I said, it's a three-party thing. The, the companies have to go negotiate with the landowners in their proposed spacing unit, and they have to get agreement from the owners, the, the people who control at least 60% of that land. Before they, I mean, that's part of the permit package. It's part of the permit package. And my understanding is there's already those packages in all uh, I don't know if that's true. These packages are on file from three years ago up in Avon. So two years ago, I took a trip up to Avon to the DEC office in Avon, and I asked them, I said, give me all the files which have applications for permits to develop Marcella shale gas in New York State. And they gave them to me, 57 of them, in a cardboard box. Well, they were in Avon, but they're no longer relevant because the permits are no longer legal because the permits were written out and filled out by the company according to no longer existing regulations. So they're, they're nonsense, but that's where I got these. They're public record, by the way. Whether they're in Albany or Avon, they're public record. If you want to know what a gas company is doing in your neighborhood, you have a right to know. Okay, so the myth is multi-well pads and cluster drilling reduce surface impact. I talked about the logical nonsense there. It's not reducing, it's creating surface impact. It's a choice between not having any or having it. The truth is that multi-well pads and cluster drilling facilitates and prolongs intense industrialization. The photographs I showed you, I think, bear that out. And they leave a longer and larger footprint than what we've been used to in New York State. So what? What are the health impacts? Long-term noise, dust, and light pollution. Nitrous oxide emissions from all the heavy-duty diesel operating, diesel engines operating on the pads, on the compressor stations. Higher spill probabilities. 
If you have 10 or 12 or 16 wells on a pad, the probability that a spill is going to occur is greater than if you have one well on a pad. Why? Because you're now bringing 5.5 million gallons times 16 to a place instead of 80,000 gallons to a place. I'm sorry, even the sixth graders here would understand that probability. Venting and accidental emissions of produced gases increase because it's a heavy industrial activity that occurs over a long period of time. And much of the ancillary equipment that remains behind, the condensate tanks, the dehydrators, the compressors, they run forever. And they vent and they leak. Somebody had their hand up. Yes? You have this <clears throat> you have a half mile by two mile track that's going to be drilled. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's assume they get their 60% of people wanting to lease. The other 40% of the people, what if they're right in the middle of that pad? Will all that equipment be placed right in the middle of their property? Um, the answer is probably not, but you have to read the fine print in the compulsory integration law. If you are an unwilling, and I'm not using the correct terminology here because I'm not a lawyer, if you're an unwilling participant that does not give the company the right to surface access to your land unless they claim some sort of eminent domain to put in a pipeline, in which case, sorry, eminent domain rules. So if you say, I don't want you on my land, I'm not going to sign as a willing participant, they can't come on your surface, but they can take the gas from underneath you, and then they have to compensate you for it at the minimum allowed by law, 12.5%. But hire a lawyer. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> okay? Read the fine print. Yes? Um, quick question, just on what you just said, the eminent domain. Yeah. If you're outside of that compulsory area, can they still do eminent domain? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Read the, read the headlines in Pennsylvania yesterday and today. In fact, in the, in the Ithaca Journal this morning. Okay. Do we have time for one more? Yes? You said nothing about the water, the chemicals in the water. How is that mediated? Okay. Let's come back here. Higher spill probabilities of frac fluid. So what's in frac fluid? Let's go over the basics. I already told you that there's one chemical that has to go into the frac fluid, and that's a lubricant. That's what makes it slick water. Although some companies currently are using a combination of slick water and hybrid hydraulic fracturing fluid. That means... It's invisible? Uh, in, in, it does not dissolve in water. Okay. Um, so that is one chemical that's required. There are four others that are absolutely required. Each company has its own magic formula that it adjusts well by well, pad by pad, and according to accumulating experience. So you have to have a lubricant. You have to have an acid. Why? Why do you need hydrochloric acid? You've got to clean out the well bore. You've got to clean out the perfs in order to get the hydraulic fracturing process to work effectively. Okay. You got to have a bactericide, a biocide. Why? Because otherwise bacteria will grow someplace where it's warm and wet down there, and the bacteria will grow and clog the well. You have to have an anti-corrosive. For the same reason you need an anti-corrosive in your internal combustion engine in your car, otherwise you corrode out your radiator and your engine. So an anti-corrosive has to be added. An anti-scaling additive. We all know what scale is. It's the stuff you have to wash off the walls of your bathtub and your shower, right? Mineral deposits from water creates scale. If the scale is not cleaned out of the well, it clogs the well and reduces production. Those are the five absolutely essential chemicals that have to exist in every frac job. Yes, it is true that by percent, those five chemicals probably account for less than 1% by volume or by weight of the frac fluid. But again, that's the wrong question to ask. The question to ask is, at what percentage does any of those things become harmful to human health? So again, it's really easy to have the wool pulled over your eyes by thinking of small numbers in a world of big numbers. 1%, who cares if there's only a half a percent chemicals? That can't possibly hurt me, unless I tell you that some of those chemicals are carcinogenic or hazardous to human health at a concentration of one part in a million. Or, in the case of benzene, five parts in a billion. 
Five parts in a billion, let's see, what's that? Now, somebody has to do a quick calculation. If I have five million gallons of frac fluid, how much benzene would I have to add, add to it in order for the, the entire five million gallons to become carcinogenic? It's not a, it's not a large number. <laughs> five parts in a billion. Somebody do the math and let me know before the night's over. Um, so now the question is, that's what goes down. What comes back up is a frac fluid which has concentrations of all those things in it. But while it's been down there, and it's not down there just for a few hours, frac fluid comes back forever. So when a company says we're only getting 10 or 15% of the frac fluid return, again, that's disingenuous. They have to answer the following two questions. Over what period of time did you measure? And at what rate is it still coming back after you stopped measuring? You hear that? Because here's what you don't know. It is a committee decision made by the board of directors of the company when to declare, declare frac fluid to stop being flac, frac fluid and start becoming brine. Does the fluid that comes back up of the well know what it's called? Does it say, I'm frac fluid now, but at the very instant that a company says that well is in production, by convention, frac fluid stops being called frac fluid. And now it's produced water or brine, because it sounds easier, right? It doesn't sound as dangerous. If it's only brine, it's produced water, it's not dangerous. But it's exactly the same stuff that was coming up one minute before when it was called frac fluid. The highest rate of return of the frac fluid is in the first few days. The highest rate of return is the first minute, and then it diminishes over time. But it never goes to zero. That's why you see all those tanks out in the fields around here, those plastic 1,000-gallon tanks. They're collecting brine from wells that are 30 years old. The rate at which the stuff comes up decreases in time. The concentration of bad stuff in it increases in time. The stuff that comes up 10 years from now is more dangerous than the stuff that comes up today. Why? Because it's been accumulating down there salts, heavy metals, naturally occurring radioactive materials. Okay, these are the good questions. There are five things that can be done with it. You ready? Let's see, uh, somebody name one of them. No, 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 let's, let's talk about the obvious one. Let's talk about the obvious illegal one first. Spread it, spread it on our road. You, you lost it someplace, it got spilled. Okay, so here's a story. I, I, uh, I'm famous for my classes at Cornell for just one thing, and that's telling stories. Okay, my students really like to come to my class because I tell them real world stories. So twice in the last six months, I'm driving down Route 86, Interstate 86, on my way to Corning from Horseheads. Get on 86 and Horseheads on my way to Corning. Twice I got behind a, quote, residual waste truck that had come out of Pennsylvania and it's on its way to Ohio. Both times I had to turn on my windshield wipers and it wasn't raining. Yeah. The valve is open on the back a little bit. Why? Because they have to pay for every gallon that they take to Ohio. When it gets to the other end, they pay by the amount that gets there, not the amount that got on the truck to begin with. You know that? Okay, so the first way, first way to get rid of the, flat, the waste is to just dump it someplace. Second is you can legally dump it someplace. Road de-icer, road spreading. Yeah, the state of New York in certain circumstances will allow brine or produced water to be spread on roads. Wait a minute, isn't that frac fluid? Yeah. But it's no longer frac fluid because it came from a well that's in production. And because the well is declared in production, you can't call it frac fluid anymore. You have to call it brine or produced water. Okay, so that's the second way. Third way, transport it to a sewage plant, a sewage treatment plant, also called a POTW. Those of you who have been monitoring what's going on in Pennsylvania know that for the first three years or so of Marcellus development in Pennsylvania, a very large percentage of the waste the frac waste coming out of wells in Pennsylvania was trucked to publicly owned sewage plants. Publicly owned sewage plants have been designed to treat biological waste, toilet flushing, garbage disposal. The stuff that comes out of a well is not biological waste, it's chemical waste. 
Sewage treatment plants cannot remove that stuff. So it passes through the sewage treatment plant and into surface waters, which downstream become somebody's drinking water. And so last summer, or last spring, the Pennsylvania DEP said, yeah, you know what, we got a problem here. You know, 350,000 people in Pittsburgh went without water for a few months. They had to go and bottle the water because they couldn't drink the water out of the Monongahela because the Monongahela had too high concentrations of bad stuff. So now Pennsylvania re requests, does not require, requests that companies cease and desist from that form of disposal. New York State will permit it. Our current version of our SGEIS says if you apply for a permit and you meet certain conditions, we will permit the use of publicly owned sewage treatment plants for waste disposal. I thought we were supposed to learn from things that go wrong someplace. So that's the third way. Fourth way, industrial waste treatment plants. Industrial waste treatment plants exist. There's probably one in Ithaca. What happens to the industrial waste, the liquid waste that comes out of Borg Warner? Where does it go? No, I hope they didn't flush it down the drain. What happens to the industrial waste that comes out of Cornell? It's trucked to an industrial waste treatment plant. They assay it, they figure out what's in it, and they design a treatment specifically for that waste. How many industrial waste treatment plants capable of processing waste from gas wells exist in New York State today? Zero. There are seven in Pennsylvania. Who should be responsible for taking care of their own waste? I'm being political here for a minute, and I'm being sociological. Okay, if a company produces the waste in conjunction with the people who let them produce the waste, the landowners, it is their responsibility to dispose of it. Not you and I, we're taxpayers. I'm not gonna benefit from this, but I'll be damned if I'm gonna pay for it. So where is the requirement in our SGEIS that says, if a company comes to town and they produce billions of gallons of waste from 60,000 gas wells, they are required to build and maintain to state regulations their own industrial waste treatment plants. I didn't read that anywhere. I suggested it as part of my comments. Hope a lot of other people did. So that's the fourth technique. The fifth technique is, in my opinion, the best thing that can be done right now, and that is recycling and reuse. Now, listen carefully. Two years ago, I got into a big imbroglio, you know, verbal fisticuffs with the Marcella Shale Coalition because their chief spokesperson two years ago was saying, Marcellus drillers in Pennsylvania are now recycling and reusing nearly 100% of their wastes. That's like saying all the stuff that goes to a pad, not a single drop ever leaves. If you believe that, then you believe in perpetual motion. Okay, current statistic, check me on this. Susquehanna, Susquehanna River Basin Commission, a month ago, published data that said, in 2010, as an industry, the Marcellus industry in Pennsylvania recycled 14% of its waste. Not 100%, not 50, not 70, 14%. Now you don't hear anything more about recycling and reuse. It was a big deal a year ago because they found out that it's expensive. Recycling and reuse means more equipment, specialized equipment, specialized training, and extra cost. It's still cheaper to truck it, Ohio, West Virginia, dump it down injection wells and cause earthquakes. Okay. How many licensed EPA-regulated injection wells are there in New York State? There's seven in Pennsylvania. There are hundreds in Ohio, hundreds in West Virginia. So the stuff is getting shipped by truck, and as it's getting shipped by truck, you have the probability, I would say the certainty, that some of it doesn't get there. Okay, so that's what you can do. This is a conundrum. This is the major environmental, on-the-ground environmental problem with unconventional gas development. It produces very large volumes of liquid wastes, and we have no good place to put them in New York State. In, in Texas, it's a no-brainer. Texas has over 50,000 in underground injection wells, waste disposal wells. Different, different geology, different state, different solution. Okay, 
Can I take 10, 15 more minutes? Is that okay? If you need to leave, it's okay. So some of you are still not having your dinner yet, right? So I don't mind. I won't be insulted. Natural gas is a clean fossil fuel. Natural gas is a cleaner fossil fuel. Natural gas is the cleanest burning fossil fuel. Natural gas is the best transition fuel to a sustainable energy future. Okay. Uh, the first three of those are sort of true. The last one is not true at all. Let's see why. Okay. I gotta warn you right now, there are people in the audience, I'm absolutely certain, who aren't gonna like what I'm about to say because there are people here who do not believe that global climate change is occurring, and there are people here who believe it is occurring, but humans have nothing to do with it. So what I'm going to say, you're not going to like. I'm sorry. I'm a scientist engineer. I have my own set of beliefs based on my interpretation of data and information, and I'm going to talk about what I think I understand. So I apologize beforehand if you, if you find what I'm about to say objectionable. If you want to debate it, fine, we can do that. Basics. Another graph. Year, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as measured by the United States Oceanographic Administration, National, Oce National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. I can never get the acronyms right. It's a federal agency. Okay? The black line shows that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is continuously rising. In 2010, it was 390 parts per million. A year later, it's 392 parts per million. So it's going up at roughly two parts per million per year. I believe that's because of the burning of fossil fuels. Coal, oil, natural gas. You can believe what you want. I'm telling you what I believe. Climate scientists, reputable climate scientists, claim that if we ever get that number to 450, we're in deep doo-doo. We reach what's called a climate tipping point. All kinds of non-linearities kick in. And if you think it's been warm the last couple days, wait to see what happens at 450 parts per million. That's what they're saying. It's hard to imagine. So if we can't get the 450, and we're already at 390, and it's going up two parts per million per year, we've got 30 years to change this situation. We have to get that black line to start coming down, not 100 years from now, within 30 years, within our lifetime, and certainly within our children's lifetime, and certainly within our grandchildren's lifetime. And you can believe that or not. But that's not the whole story, because carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas which is causing global warming. So is methane. Methane is natural gas. So here's the data on methane concentration in the atmosphere. This is really cool. The year 1000, here we are, um, 2012. How did they figure out what the concentration of methane was in the atmosphere in the year 1000? Ice cores. Ice cores, that's one way. There are actually four or five different ways of doing it. But what do you notice here, those of you who are history buffs, up until about 1700, the concentration of methane in the Earth's atmosphere is about constant. What began happening in about 1700? Industrial Revolution. What happens during the Industrial Revolution? Started off with choo-choo, burned a lot of coal, right? Then we started burning a lot of oil, and now we're burning a lot of coal, a lot of oil, and a lot of natural gas, and look what happens. So the natural background level of methane in the atmosphere is currently about two parts per million. 2,000 parts per billion is two parts per million. Remember that number, two parts per million. So what? Problem is that methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. I'll repeat that. One molecule of methane absorbs much more heat in the atmosphere than does a molecule of carbon dioxide. By how much? Well, it depends upon how long you're willing to measure. If you're willing to measure out 100 years and compare that, Methane is 33 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So one methane molecule has the heating potential of three molecules of carbon dioxide. If you only want to measure over 20 years, and remember, we only have 30 years to fix this climate problem, then it's a factor of 105. One methane molecule has the same heating potential in the atmosphere as 105 carbon dioxide molecules. 
Conclusion, a very small amount of methane is as important as a large amount of carbon dioxide. So what? Methane leaks during gas development, purposefully and accidentally. I showed you different forms of leaking, didn't I? I'll show you some more in a minute. So during the process of developing natural gas, either conventionally or unconventionally, there is methane leaking, either purposefully or accidentally. It's important to know how much. In research that we're doing at Cornell, we're trying to quantify it. So now I'm going to show you what most people in industry and what my colleague Don Siegel says never happens. During flowback, right, millions of gallons of flowback flow fluid for about two weeks has a lot of gas in it. Where's that gas go? Well, they can't hook it up to a pipeline because then we'd, they'd be putting frac fluid in the pipeline. <laughs> Uh, they could possibly separate the gas from the liquid, they could, and then they could either capture it or they can burn it in a flare. But according to the EPA, 85% of the time it just gets vented. You've seen the same movies I've seen on YouTube. Somebody goes to a frac site and they're taking a video of the flowback process and you're seeing a big slug of fluid and then spurting. Psst, 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 psst. That's the gas coming out. I'll show you a video. This is a still photograph taken by a friend of mine in Pennsylvania in Dimmick during the flowback period of a, of a couple of wells in Dimmick. Here you see water vapor. You can see water vapor, the naked eye. For scale, here's a piece of heavy equipment. Now I'm going to show you a video that was taken with a special camera called a FLIR camera, forward-looking infrared radar, which can be tuned so that what it sees is what the human eye cannot see. It can see heat, for example, if it's tuned to see heat. It can see hydrocarbons. Ooh, you can't see methane. It's colorless. But you can see it with a FLIR camera. And so you're going to see a video. And I'll explain what you're looking at here. Everything which is yellow is a hydrocarbon. Okay. Everything which is yellow is hydrocarbon. Notice that it's rising because methane is lighter than air. It's 58% of the density of air. Methane comes out of the ground, up it goes. It's also hot because it's about 200 degrees Fahrenheit down there, so when it comes up, it's hot. So up it goes. Is that just a little leak? Watch, we're gonna pan over here now, and you're gonna see that same piece of heavy equipment come into the scene. There it is. So what you're looking at here is not a little pinhole leak. That's billowing clouds of methane, which companies say doesn't happen. But EPA says it happens 85% of the time, and there's a video that says it happened in Dimmick last June. Um, a Shell engineer told me to my face at Cornell last year. Last year. He's the chief engineer for Shell in Tioga County. We never flare. Shell policy, we don't flare. I said, well, how do you get rid of the gas? He said, I don't know. I'll check up on it for you. I've emailed him three times and said, would you please tell me where the gas goes if it's not flared? He refuses to answer. OK, I mentioned ancillary equipment before, compressor stations. This is the well-known DISH Texas. There's all of DISH. Here's the DISH high end. These are the, the multi-hundred-thousand-dollar mansions. Here's the compressor stations in their backyard. Compressor stations leak. So here's a FLIR picture, no video. This is the so-called vent stack. Um, what you're seeing here in purple is methane. Um, gas also leaks through pipelines. There are three kinds of pipelines. Gathering lines connect every well to a compressor station. In the compressor station, the gas is compressed into a pressure that puts it into a transmission line. Transmission lines are long distance lines, large diameter, high pressure. They go to a city gate where they go into distribution lines. So everybody here who lives in downtown Ithaca probably is on municipal gas, right? So there's a gas line under every street in Ithaca. There's one in Cayuga Heights that sends gas into my house. Low pressure, low di small diameter. They leak. Average age of transmission pipelines in the United States is over 50 years. Average age of distribution lines in some of our big cities, 70 years. 
What I'm about to show you is very recent data taken by Professor Phillips at Boston University who has very high-tech equipment that is able to monitor what's called the flux of methane in the atmosphere. He drives up and down the streets of downtown Boston and he measures the concentration of methane in the atmosphere. If none of the pipes are leaking, that number should be two, two parts per million. All right, that's the average concentration of methane in the atmosphere. If there's leaking, there's going to be more. Every place that you see these spikes of yellow, right, here's a street that he traversed. Here's another set of streets that he traversed. Every place where you see spikes, the methane concentration is higher than normal background, which means there's leaking. The pipes under these streets are leaking. These spikes are sometimes 20 to 50 times higher than background. According to data that he got from the state of Massachusetts, there are currently 28,000 documented leaks in distribution pipelines in the state of Massachusetts that are unrepaired. In the United States, there are hundreds of thousands. Methane into the atmosphere. Compressor stations emit not just methane, but hydrocarbons that have been burned partially. So I want you to watch very closely here. Here's a distant view of a plume, a black plume. Uh, the photographer, in this case Bob Donan, zoomed in and he saw a flare stack. And this is particulate emission from the flare stack. Unburned hydrocarbons and black carbon soot. Notice the date, notice the time. September 18th of last year, 2.03 p.m. Five days later, 728, still going on. Go down there, it's still going on. It goes on forever. That's what happens at a processing station. When you get wet gas, you got to do this. Bottom line, it's getting late. Professor Howarth, Renee Santoro, and I published a paper last April. First paper it's ever been published in this area, peer-reviewed, prestigious journal. And we compared uh, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide and methane, from shale gas, conventional gas, coal, and diesel. So the idea is you look at the top of each one of these bars. Big bar means bad, little bar means good. Got it? Okay. So we estimated that the correct answer is somewhere between here and here. We don't know what the correct answer is because we don't have sufficient data. Industry has not been required to supply to the EPA or any other government agency the volume of gas which is vented during flowback. They're not required to report it until July of this year. They will now be required to report it. So we'll be able to go back and hopefully narrow this estimate. This is our high-end estimate. This is our low-end estimate. We're fairly certain it's at least this high. It could be as, this, as much as this high. But let's take our low-end estimate. It says that if you burn and produce natural gas, burning it produces carbon dioxide, producing it emits methane into the atmosphere, it's dirtier than coal or oil. Is it a good transition fuel to a sustainable future? Should we be using it instead of coal? Well, no. <laughs> it's dirtier. So should we be using more coal? No. <laughs> because burning coal produces carbon dioxide and methane and all other kinds of bad stuff. The whole idea is you gotta reduce all of these. Otherwise, we reach the tipping point in 30 years. That's the message, folks. We're the last generation that can commit fossil fuel generational greed. We are the last generation on Earth that can commit fossil fuel generational greed. We gotta solve the problem for the kids and the grandkids in our lifetime. We got 20 to 30 years to do it. I'm gonna skip all the rest if you wanna go off. We wrote that first paper in April. Since then there have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine additional papers. We wanted that to happen. Our first paper had a stated objective in the paper is we wanted other scientists to redo our experiment, see if we're right. And if we're not, tell us where we're wrong, improve the modeling, improve the data, improve the assumptions, get better data from the government, get better data from the industry. All that is beginning to happen. 
Bottom line, last slide, I promise, it's the last graph. If you can sit through this one, you get a, everybody gets an, ace, an A, and I'll give you a, an honorary PhD from Cornell. <laughs> this is hot off the presses. This appeared in an article in Science Magazine, which is the single most prestigious cited magazine in the universe, I think. It's either nature or science. Okay. It's a journal. It's a peer-reviewed journal. And the article was written by, I think, 18 scientists from around the world, including a guy named Drew Schindel, who works for the Goddard Institute for Space Sciences at NASA. He's the lead author. And this is a very important graph. Memorize it. Take it home. Tell your kids and grandkids about it. This graph is either going to make you really, really depressed, or it's going to leave you with great hope that we can do something about climate change. So I've got to explain it to you. Pay attention. Horizontal axis, year, 1900, all the way out to 2070. Vertical axis is the change, the change in the average temperature on Earth relative to what's now called baseline. We had to establish a baseline. And science agrees, the scientists around the world agreed that we're going to take the 20-year period from 1890 to 1910 as baseline. We know what the average Earth temperature was then. So what this is showing is the change since then. So here's 1910. So there's no change because that's the baseline. But as we proceed, you can see that the change is increasing in a positive way. Right now, we're about 9 tenths of a degree centigrade warmer on average on Earth than we were 100 years ago. And you might say, who cares? 9 tenths of a degree centigrade? Problem is, it's another one of those things where a small change can have a big effect. A melting of the polar ice caps. Average temperatures worldwide for the first 10 years of this decade were higher than in any other period in human history. Other evidences, and we're experiencing one right now. Was it 60 yesterday? Okay, so here's what you need to know. So here we are in roughly 2000, let's see, this is uh, 2000, 2010, 2000, yeah, here we are, 2012. See that purple line? That's called reference. That's disaster, that's if we do nothing. If we don't believe that climate change is occurring and or we don't believe that humans are causing it and we make no attempt to decrease our consumption of fossil fuels, this is what happens, that purple line. When we get to 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees, bad things begin to happen. That's the tipping point. That's the 450 parts per million. That's when Earth climate becomes really, really bad for a lot of people on Earth. And it's irreversible. Once we get then, the grandkids have inherited something we didn't want to leave them. So we don't ever want to get into that yellow zone. And we certainly don't want to get into that orange zone. If we do nothing, we're going to be there 2010, 2020, in about 2025. Not 100 years from now. 13 years from now. This is hot off the pressures. This paper came out last week. So we don't want to be on that purple curve. We also don't want to be on the red curve. The red curve is we do everything we can technologically, politically, and sociologically to decrease the rate at which we're burning fossil fuels. That's a carbon dioxide attack. We attack carbon dioxide. And look what happens. No effect until 2010, 2020, 2030, 2040. We start seeing an effect, but we're already into the yellow zone, and we are destined to get into the red zone. That's all she wrote. Kids and grandkids are screwed. Really? Why? If we start attacking the carbon dioxide problem today, put a big carbon tax, right? All that stuff that Congress refuses to do something about. The reason is that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for over 100 years. So all that carbon dioxide we've been putting into the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, most of it's still there, still doing its harm. So it will take 100 years from now to have a very strong effect by reducing carbon dioxide. That's not the proper thing to do, policy-wise. 
Suppose we forget about carbon dioxide and we say, let's attack methane and black carbon. Black carbon from burning diesel, black carbon from processing plants, that black soot that you saw going up in the atmosphere, that's really bad stuff for climate change, and so is methane. So suppose we begin now and we attack methane and black carbon, BC stands for black carbon. Then as you can see, we have postponed until 2010, 2020, 2030, maybe 2035 before we enter into the danger zone. What this graph says is that the best way we can spend our money now is on reducing methane emission. Obviously, the right thing to do is reducing carbon dioxide, stop burning fossil fuels at the rate we're burning them as quickly as we can, culturally and sociologically and economically. Reduce methane as quickly as we can, culturally, socially, economically. Reduce black carbon, culturally, socially, economically. And that puts us on the best thing we can possibly do, which is this curve right here which means we're now somewhere out in the 2040 to 2050 when things get really bad. But if we stay the course, this curve comes over and starts coming down. So our grandchildren who are alive at the end of this century can get back to where we were about now. That's our future, folks. You can believe it or not, it's science. It's the best science that's available. It will continue to change. These bars right here are error bars. Nobody can be certain about this stuff. It says if we do this, even if we do this, there's a possibility that we'd be better off than here, but there's also a possibility that we're worse off. It might already be too late. That's depressing. Despite our best efforts, it might already be too late. But I'm not a depressing guy. I'm a positive guy. We will find a way over the next 50 or 60 years to enhance our technology. We will find our way to increase efficiency and conservation. We will find a way to substitute green, sustainable energy sources of the types that you and I know about for fossil fuels. We have to do it. We're the last generation that has a choice. If we make the wrong choice, the next two generations aren't going to like living on Earth. And I'm sorry, a ticket to Mars or that 13,000 person colony on the moon. <laughs> Not a good place to spend money, folks. This is a good place to spend money. So, uh, enough. Let me get to the end. You want more information. Everybody who's come to speak to you has given you data, information, insights, and helped you understand what we're talking about. I hope I've added to that. I don't pretend to believe that I've given you everything you need to know. I don't pretend to believe that you believe everything I've said. So you're always going to be looking for good sources of information. I have a prejudice about good sources of information. I go to sources of information where I know that what's there is vetted. It's peer-reviewed science. It's government reports. It's not blog stuff. And it doesn't come out of an institution that has a financial conflict of interest. People who have come and talked to you here have leased their land. I haven't. I don't have any land to lease. I sold my land to the Nature Conservancy to protect it from gas development. I do not have a conflict of interest. I am not being paid to be here. I, am, I refuse to, I wouldn't even take free cookies. I don't take gas money, I don't take honoraria. I've been doing this for three years. No compensation. I don't want it. I refuse to accept it because it puts me in a conflict of interest. Okay. So where should you go to get information? Two years ago, a bunch of colleagues of mine who are physicians, scientists, and engineers <laughs> formed an organization called PSE Healthy Energy, Physicians, Science, and Scientists, and Engineers for Healthy Energy. We have a website. On that website, we think we have among the best places to go on the web to get what we think is good information, unbiased, without conflict of interest, peer-reviewed government reports, peer-reviewed academic reports, and in some cases, peer-reviewed industry reports. So if you want more information, there's our website. Uh, I am also on the board of directors of an organization called Earthworks. Some of you have heard of it. It's an environmental group, not a big one. It's not a Sierra Club or an NRDC. 
but it's highly competent and it started 10 years ago, something called the Oil and Gas Accountability Project. So its website is here, and again, it's full of really good information that I think is as close to fact as you're gonna get anywhere on the web. So in addition to what I told you tonight, I now assign you those two websites to go read at your leisure. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention and participation, and hopefully we still have some time for more questions, although the questions I got so far have been fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. We're going to take about a five-minute break and then come back for questions and answers. I do have four announcements I failed to mention earlier. During the introduction, uh, first of all, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Roy Barrier, the town supervisor. Um, the second announcement, if you didn't have a chance to sign in, there's a sign-in table uh, or chart on the outside in the hallway here. Uh, if you would, please sign in during the break, uh, just for our records. The third thing, uh, the questions, uh, the question and answer period, the way we're going to work it is Dr. Ingrafia will take questions right from the floor. Uh, we ask that you speak loud enough so that we can get this on tape, though, and we also ask that you state your name and address. Um, if, you, if you need a mic, though, we'll have a mic um, in the center of the floor here so you can use the mic. And the fourth thing is we need to end by 9.30 so the custodial staff has enough time to, to get this room cleaned up and ready for tomorrow. Uh, so as you're leaving, we, we will end on time, but as you're leaving, if you would, fold your chairs and uh, put them at the entry, uh, at the entrance, so that uh, he can put them away quickly. Okay, so let's take a, a short five-minute break. Yeah.